Hello and good afternoon everybody. My name is Chris Van Dam and I'm a research fellow at Chatham House on the Africa programme. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all this afternoon to our uh, seminar on South Africa, uh, the role of opposition and alternative policy for South Africa's economic recovery with John Steenhuisen, uh, who will be joined for the Q&A by Gwen and Gwenya. Uh, the meeting is going to be chaired by Alex Beresford, who is an associate professor at the University of Leeds. I'd just like to point out a few technical details before I hand over to Alex. Uh, and that's just to say that this meeting is on the record. So that means that you can use the information and say who said what. I'd also like to point out that during the Q&A session, um, you'll be able to raise your hand by using the raise hand function on Zoom and uh, Alex will take questions in groups of three. Uh, when you are called to ask your question, we, you will be able to unmute yourself and ask. Uh, Zoom participants may also submit written questions through the Q&A box throughout the meeting, and we will take some of those questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to take questions from participants joining us through Facebook Live. Uh, please accept our apologies for this. Um, so just a reminder that this is on the record, um, but uh, attendees are asked that filming and recording are not allowed without the prior permission of Chatham House. So, Alex, over to you. Thank you, Chris, and, and good day to everyone. Um, for those of you who, were, who tuned in last week, um, this is part of a, a longer term series of events looking at South Africa. Last week, we had the uh, Treasurer General of the ANC, Paul Mashatile, talking about their, the ANC's vision for uh, the recovery of the South Africa's economy after COVID-19. And Paul talked in particular about the need to return to what he called the fundamentals of the reconstruction and development program of the ANC. This week, I'm very pleased to welcome John Steenhazen, uh, who is currently the interim leader of the Democratic Alliance and has been since November. Uh, he currently leads the official opposition in the Parliament of South Africa's National Assembly. And indeed, in February 2020, he an announced his intention to run um, for the DA's leadership, and that will be decided at the DA's elective Congress in October this year. Um, I'm also delighted to introduce to you today uh, Gwen Nguenya. Um, she's the head of the Federal Policy Unit for the Democratic Alliance. Um, previously, Gwen was herself an MP and served before that as the Chief Operations Officer at the South African Institute for Race Relations. So I'm delighted to introduce these two speakers to you today. John's going to speak to us first for around about 20 minutes, and he's going to be outlining uh, the position on the role of the opposition and alternative policy for South Africa's economic recovery. And then we're going to have a series of questions that both John and Gwen uh, will be able to answer, we hope, at the end. So without further ado, I'll hand straight over to John. Great. Thank you so much, Alex. And thank you very, very much to all of you uh, for the wonderful opportunity to be able to participate uh, in this incredible forum. Uh, I'm not the first leader of the Democratic Alliance to speak at a Chatham House event, but I'm absolutely sure I'm the first one to do so from a computer here in Parliament in Cape Town, South Africa, rather than at uh, the podium uh, in London. Uh, and so here I am via Zoom. I think the events of the last few months have reshaped our world in ways that we could barely have imagined. If someone at the beginning of 2020 had told us what the world would look like in just a few short months, I think many of us would probably have struggled uh, to believe them. And yet here we all are, citizens of the world, adapting, evolving and coping. The thing is that South Africans and humans are resilient and resourceful. Uh, many, many businesses around the world have been forced to completely reinvent uh, and evolve at incredible speed. And so too have many of our schools and our universities. Even the way in which we seek out the most basic human need, that is human contact, has undergone a significant and dramatic change. The coronavirus, as devastating as it is, uh, will not defeat us. It's going to test us but it won't win. 
But that's not to say that the coming months and perhaps even years are going to be easy. Across the world, the journey towards the post-COVID recovery has already begun in earnest. And this journey is going to look very, very different uh, for many, many different countries. In the developed world of the Europe, Asia, and North America, governments will have many, many more chess pieces and levers to move around than many of the developing countries in the world. The ability, for instance, for the United Kingdom to extend income support to citizens or to assist stricken businesses so that they can save uh, the livelihoods of their employees bears almost no resemblance whatsoever to the myriad of challenges and limitations faced by developing nations such as South Africa. And it's this ability to bounce back that should determine the extent of the measures taken to slow the spread of the coronavirus. Shutting down the economy for an extended period can be justified if a government has the extensive resources to protect its citizens from extreme poverty and hunger in the wake of such a lockdown. But in South Africa, we've just come out of a nine week hard lockdown. It's now the longest in the world and our government cannot even begin to shield our citizens from the brutal effects uh, of this lockdown. Our government has tried to copy the lockdown playbook of nations that find themselves in an entirely different situation to ours. Now, whatever number you may have in your head as a bad outcome for job losses post COVID, double it and you can double it again because a 50% unemployment rate is now being touted as the realistic expectation in South Africa. And the consequences of that are profound. Massive GDP loss is being predicted for South Africa. The consequences of that will be profound. Bear in mind that this is in a country where more than 10 million South Africans already don't have work and where 17 million social grants are paid out every month from a tax revenue that continues to miss its collection targets uh, by increasing margins year after year. And I think it's also important to bear in mind when processing these numbers, these particularly the massive unemployment numbers, that South Africa has a population size roughly the same as that of the United Kingdom. So post COVID job losses in South Africa are predicted to be anywhere between three and seven million. And you add to that the number of South African citizens who are going to be in long queues for state assistance. And I think you start to appreciate the real scale of the problem uh, that we face in, in an economy like South Africa's. The reality is that our government has used the bluntest possible instrument to respond to the pandemic. And in doing so, it's created a lockdown crisis that is going to dwarf the COVID crisis at least tenfold. But perhaps most disturbingly is that it is revealed a unfortunate authoritarian streak amongst many in our executive. And many of these ministers have found themselves with seemingly unfettered power under the Disaster Management Act, which was enacted by the government just prior to our lockdown starting. And over the course of the last few months have been churning out a raft of petty irrational regulations that have had absolutely nothing to do whatsoever uh, with stopping the spread of the virus or slowing infections and everything to do with their own personal crusades. So we've had regulations around what clothes you could buy, how you should wear those clothes. We've had bans on e-commerce and of course the very controversial ban on tobacco and alcohol uh, which uh, still remains in place, certainly from the tobacco perspective, as we sit here this evening. And I think this is important because just yesterday in the North Gauteng High Court, a damning judgment was handed down, uh, which ruled that many of these regulations were irrational and not justifiable in an open and democratic South Africa. Now, my party, the Democratic Alliance, uh, has also challenged the constitutionality of the uh, Disaster Management Act itself. And for the reason that we believe there's no parliamentary oversight whatsoever. And we've also taken on a number of the more irrational and unreasonable regulations individually. 
But what has essentially happened is that through its own actions, government has squandered whatever goodwill and buy-in they might have had at the start of the crisis. Our lockdown was originally scheduled to be three weeks, but three became five, and then those five were followed by another four weeks of restrictions that were barely distinguishable from the hard lockdown itself, including a bizarre military curfew, uh, which kicked in in the evenings. But the really sad truth about all of this is that those nine weeks have been largely wasted. Now, the sole reason for a lockdown is to slow the rate of infection, uh, to buy your healthcare time to be able to respond effectively, and to dramatically ramp up testing and tracing capabilities. But that hasn't happened uh, in South Africa. And there's a reason why government is being so opaque and coy with releasing the data to the public. And that is because the data itself is so damning and shows that those nine weeks, which came at a cost of around about 13 billion rand uh, loss in our economy every day, have come at a massive, massive price. And so outside of the DA run Western Cape, there's very little indication that we're anywhere near ready for what is to be the coming peak and wave of infections. And our testing program has only managed a small fraction of the targets of between 16 to 60,000 tests per day. And we're now sitting with massive laboratory backlogs uh, of, uh, of hundreds of thousands. And so we've got almost now nothing to show for the nine weeks of hard lockdown uh, that in the end are going to cause far greater suffering and far more premature deaths than the virus itself ever would or could. Now, we're not Italy, we're not Germany, we're not Spain, and we don't have anywhere near the kinds of resources and reserves that those economies had to be able to deal with this and to take this knock. And the truth is that we couldn't have entered into the COVID virus any lower in the water as an economy than we were. The South African economy had already been in a technical recession for six years where our GDP growth had been outstripped by our population growth. And we'd entered into a recession long before the COVID-19 pandemic hit. Our two consecutive quarters of negative growth, which as you know, define an economic recession, were quarters three and four of 2019. But these came months uh, before COVID-19 even came onto the scene. And this recession wasn't a once-off either. The economy in 2018 had contracted for the first two qu consecutive quarters uh, in that first half. And so uh, last year, our economic growth for the year was uh, piddling 0.2%, and that's the lowest it's been in over a decade. Coupled that with our state-owned power company, Eskom, uh, which is all but collapsed and can no longer even keep the lights on. And we have a euphemistic term for these planned rolling blackouts in South Africa. We call them load shedding. And they've become an everyday reality for uh, all South Africans. And the truth is that when steady, affordable electricity cannot be guaranteed, investors quickly turn their backs and look elsewhere. You can't keep the factories uh, floors going, you can't keep the lights on, you can't keep industrial processes moving, investors look elsewhere. Additionally, every international agency, uh, ratings agency has now consigned our economy to junk status. And so our economy is in a dire position, but it was in this dire position long before COVID-19 hit our shores. Uh, it was low in the water, COVID-19 has been a wave that has now broken over the bow. But what the pandemic has done, and done very effectively, is expose just how fraught and fragile our situation in South Africa really is. It's exposed just how little wiggle room there is in the national budget to deal with an emergency like COVID-19. It's also exposed how thin our budget was already stretched uh, before there became the need now in the COVID environment for increasing healthcare resources and scraping together some kind of, or some form, of an economic stimulus package. And it has also exposed the massive shortcomings of a truly incapable state. An incapable state is terrible in normal conditions. It's absolutely cataclysmic in a COVID-19 uh, environment. And that state has been hollowed out by decades upon decades of corruption, looting, and weak politically connected appointments. And now like a tsunami, that causes most of its damage as the wave pulls back. Government's response to the pandemic 
rather than the virus itself, is going to cause the real devastation in South Africa. But I think the good news is that it's never too late to change tack, and I think that's why we're here this evening. And South Africa does need to pick itself up and move forward uh, as best as possible. We can't change the past, but we can still influence and own the future. And we do this by acknowledging and learning from our mistakes, particularly those made during the, this last few weeks of lockdown. And I think there are five key lessons uh, that we need to draw from this last nine weeks of lockdown. The first of these is that South Africa must now end what remains of the lockdown. And we should not return to a hard economic lockdown, uh, whether during the peak to come or during any future waves of COVID-19, because the costs are far outweighing the benefits. So we must manage the virus over the next foreseeable 18 to 24 months. And we've got to ensure social distancing, wearing of masks, hygiene, and of course, isolating at-risk groups. The second point is that we've learned is that South Africa would have, been, uh, would have fared a lot better um, had power been not so concentrated in a small group of unaccountable cabinet ministers. So pretty early on in the crisis, parliament and the elected lawmakers of the country were essentially shut out of the response. And it was handed to a very small group of cabinet ministers who have kept iron, an iron fist control over it and on the information that flows out of it. Thirdly, South Africa needs to start prioritizing results over intentions. Now, the lockdown uh, intentions may have been good, but the actual net result has been overwhelmingly harmful to our economy, to society, with millions of lives and livelihoods destroyed, thousands of businesses lost, and billions of rands of tax revenue that have just simply been forgone. And what South Africa fourthly needs to do is to realize that every policy decision is essentially a trade-off rather than a simple solution. It's always tempting to devise a policy response in a vacuum, focusing on a single small problem, but society is actually a complex network of systems and of interactions. And any risk addressed that's being addressed has to be balanced very carefully against all the other risks faced by society. And finally, while we, we have to realize that while policy A may be better than policy B in theory, if it's not feasible to be able to implement in practice, then policy B may be the one that produces better results. And this particularly in the environment of an incapable state. The reality in South Africa is that we have an incapable state that is simply not able to implement many of the policies that are devised by government. The case of the lockdown is, is no better example of this. Uh, President Ramaphosa made sweeping promises of economic relief that would mitigate against the fallout from the lockdown. But every single one of those well-intentioned plans has run flat on into the brick wall of the incapable state. And so whether it's been uh, claims from the unemployment insurance fund, whether it's been applications for government's temporary uh, employer employee relief, or simply the payment of extended social grants to the millions of desperate South Africans, they've been left stranded, empty handed, and exceptionally frustrated. The incapable state has always been there, but it has been brought into stark and sharp focus by this crisis. And so what South Africa desperately needs now is for political ego and ideology to step aside and to make way for real world solutions and evidence-based decision-making. And if the DA were to be given the task of resuscitating South Africa's failing economy in the wake of the crisis, that is exactly where we would start, with the basics. For all the talk of the fourth industrial revolution and leapfrogging technologies, the best way to build a better life for all South Africans is to simply get the basics right. Everything else is noise until you've actually got those basics right, until you've laid the foundations for success. Clean water, reliable electricity, safe communities, the rule of law, and a growing inclusive market-driven economy that lifts people out of poverty and lifts them into opportunity. Now, globally, we've seen, and I'm sure there's going to be many of these lectures on this particular platform and others, 
Many of those commentators believe that the pandemic opens up the opportunity for what they're calling the new normal, uh, an environment where we live more sustainably and equitably than before. And indeed, this is a very noble and worthwhile pursuit. In many developed countries, some may be inclined to argue for the foregoing of the pursuit of some economic growth in favor of pursuing well-being, equality, and sustainability. In other words, the growth objective competes with the noble objectives of equality, well-being, and sustainability. But this is not the case in South Africa. With our, ex our case of uh, extreme unemployment, of poverty and of inequality, coupled with deep fiscal recession and a burgeoning national debt, in South Africa, the pursuit of growth is aligned with the pursuit of the noble objectives, meaning that the best way to grow well-being, to grow equality, and to grow sustainability is in fact through growth-focused policies. And this is best illustrated by way of example. And so I'd like to outline to you this evening the six policies that the DA considers to be the most powerful in terms of picking the low-hanging fruit to build a better future for South Africa and for South Africans. And the first amongst these has to be opening up our energy market to competition. Eskom is South Africa's state-owned national power utility. It is a mon monopoly buyer and seller of electricity. As we sit here this evening, it's hopelessly insolvent. It's unable to service its interest payments, let alone cover its operating costs. And it's unable to provide a power supply that is reliable and a power supply at rates that enable South Africa to compete with other countries. If our energy market is opened up to competition, supply will go up and prices will come down. Importantly, supply will be more reliable as more power will become from even greater and diverse sources. And here we think particularly of opportunity for renewables. Now this is an intensely growth focused policy since it will dramatically cut costs to business and households and particularly poor households where electricity accounts uh, still account for the greater share of household spending. The second big reform area we would focus on is on our labor legislation. South Africa is one of the most inflexible labor regimes in the world. And this is particularly tough on small, medium and micro enterprises. And it places new entrants into the market at a significant disadvantage. Relaxing our labor legislation, particularly in the post-COVID world, will enhance growth, equality, and well-being. Our rigid labor legislation may again have been well intended, but what it has resulted in is unemployment on a scale not seen anywhere else in the world. The third thing that the country has to desperately do if we're to rescue our economy and to get back onto a trajectory of growth and prosperity is to walk away from investment killing policies. So South Africa will not see any meaningful investment from foreign direct investment to local investment until the government decisively rejects the raft of investment killing policies. These are property expropriation without compensation, a national health insurance, which a country simply cannot afford, a prescription of assets, prescribed assets, and a nationalization of the Reserve Bank. Now, regardless of the intentions of each of these policies. Every one of these policies will result in lower growth, higher poverty, and greater inequality, since all of them will affect the poorest of the poor most of all. As with the opening up of the energy market, walking away from these policies requires little more from government than a simple decision and a clear direction on the way forward. The fourth thing we would do is reform and sell off state-owned entities. The intention behind state-owned entities may well be honorable and may well as again be good intentioned, but thanks to the reality of the fact that we exist in an incapable state, the results have been absolutely disastrous. State-owned entities like Eskom, our national airline, and others continue to cost the state billions that could be spent elsewhere. They crowd out opportunity and they crowd out social spending. The last budget alone, over 4 billion was cut from our healthcare budget to be able to bail out South African airways, an environment where we could actually be using that money to help fund our healthcare response now in COVID. 
So it's far better for the state to focus on its core role of education, healthcare, and social welfare, rather than propping up these overstaffed, overpaid parastatals that add very little value to our society. And fifthly, a game changer we believe would be the auctioning of the spectrum um, to bring down data costs in South Africa. Uh, we have one of the most expensive data costs in the world, and we believe that this will dramatically reduce the cost of data, which will help drive economic growth. It will also enable more work to be done remotely, which also helps to drive ecological sustainability. And this too will also have the greatest impact on the poorest in society, since a much higher percentage of their income is actually spent on data. The sixth key intervention that I wanted to speak about this evening and the time provided was an abandonment of the black economic empowerment uh, policies and racial quotas. Now, these policies best illustrate the difference, I think, between intention on the one hand and results on the other. They may have had the intention of redressing past wrongs, but their result has been to perpetuate gross inequality by enriching a very small, well-collected political elite in South Africa and killing investment uh, by rendering many South African businesses uncompetitive. The net results, compare intention and results of BE and affirmative action have been to bankrupt municipalities. Uh, we've seen large scale tender corruption, a hollowed out state and capable of uh, implementing policy. We've seen price gouging on a massive scale and a situation where 10% uh, of black, uh, uh, many black South African households are 10% poorer now than they were at the beginning of these policy implementations. And so that's where we'd start if we were voted into government tomorrow. Start with the basics, get the foundations right, and start to build from there. Time to put aside the ideological warfare and get on with doing what's best for South Africa in a country first uh, method. But as we've seen over the past 26 years, getting into government and challenging the dominance of a liberation movement is no small task. Now, we've made great strides. Uh, we've grown from a tiny 1.7% party in 1994. We're now the official opposition, as well as a party of government in one of the nine provinces, uh, in, a, in a variety of municipalities and key number of metropolitan areas around the country. And so the next step up is positioning our party as a credible party of national government. And that's going to require us to shift political perceptions in a way that has never been done before in South Africa. It's going to require of us to make the case for liberalism, individual freedom, and an open economy in a country that is still largely dominated by nationalism, a patriarchal state, and an economy with high levels of state control. Where opposition parties in democracies elsewhere in the world compete against the policies and the track record of the incumbent, we find ourselves pitted largely in South Africa against the history and mythology of the liberation movement. And it's this emotive connection to the party of the struggle that sees voters remain loyal, even when election promises are repeatedly broken, service delivery breaks down, and corruption and state capture runs rampant. Our country's brutal history of injustice and oppression has also created a really fertile ground for competing racial nationalisms, something which the ANC now eagerly pursues, and this so particularly since the hard socialist left freedom fighters have started to pull them ever more to the left, leading them down uh, many populist uh, rabbit holes. And the result is now a playing field where policy and track record hold far less sway than they should, and where voting still happens along these decade-old myths and allegiances. Now, the temptation in politics in such an environment is to spot a space in the political landscape and then try to fill it. But that space might not necessarily lend itself to our own values, our vision, and our principles. And so it's not the job of the DA to fill the void, but rather to carve out our own space. And that means that the truth is that not all voters will be available to us right now. But we have to work hard to attract the majority of those who are, and then we must actively grow our space so we can include more in the future. It's also possible 
that the future, the political future, will look different to our current political landscape. And that many of the log jams that have bedeviled South Africa over the course of the last two decades may finally be broken. The undeniable tensions and competing factions within the governing ANC, and we have long held the view that a fundamental realignment of politics around shared values rather than racial nationalism is the future for South Africa. We believe that is the only future that's worth pursuing. A future where those who stand up for freedom, for growth, for accountability, clean government and a capable state will ultimately prevail over those who still cling to the outdated 20th century ideologies and the destructive policies that go with it. That is our project in the DA. And the reality as we've learned in the last year is that there are no shortcuts in the game. We have to do the hard yards, one election at a time. Where we already govern, we've been given the huge opportunity to show that honest, accountable government does make a real difference in people's lives and their lived experiences, as well as the conditions in which they live. And we believe that sooner rather than later, that message is going to re reach a critical mass of voters, and we will have our opportunity to rebuild South Africa to its full potential. That is our mission. That's what animates us, our love for the country, and the fact that we can see a better future for it and its people, and that it's worth the fighting for. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, John. That was, that was really interesting. Um, what I'd just like to say in terms of housekeeping is if people could just use the raise hand function uh, to indicate that they'd like to ask a question, what we'll do is we'll uh, take those questions and we will try and take them in groups of three and put them to both speakers. So I'd, I'd like to uh, reintroduce Gwen back into the conversation at this point. And if I may, just to abuse the kind of chair position uh, whilst people are raising their hands, I'd, I'd just like to kick off with a question, uh, John, particularly in relation to, to what you've said. Um, you, you talked earlier on, uh, I think it was in February when you were launching your, your campaign, um, that there was a need for the DA to have some sort of ideological coherency, as you put it, because you argued that the, the party had lacked that in the last two to three years. I just wonder then, a question to both of you, um, what do you think the kind of ideological tradition should be that informs the DA and enables it to reach out to a broad base of South African voters, particularly in light of what you were just saying, John, about getting away from the 20th century ideologies, as you put it? Sure, thanks very much. Look, I mean, I, I believe that, uh, that what I said in February, I think still holds absolutely, absolutely true today. And that uh, we've got to start to break these ideological log jams, but also the DA has got to stand for something. In the last election, many voters looked at us and I think we'd fallen into the trap of becoming a weather vane rather than a road sign. A weather vane twists in the political winds and is moved by whatever the cause du jour is whereas the road sign very firmly stands for something and points a direction. And if you look at the two parties that did the best in the last election, uh, were both uh, on the left and right of us, and they were both unambiguous and unequivocal about who they were, what they stood for, and what they were fighting for. So I think that we've got to uh, root our party in fundamental values and principles uh, linked to a market-based economy, uh, respect for the rule of law, upholding the constitution, and creating policies that are able to lift people out of uh, poverty and into opportunity and start to really meaningfully redress the imbalances that we have. It's very clear that the policy suite uh, and the ideologies of the other side have not worked. We've got many, many more people in unemployment now than ever before. We've got many, many more people uh, who fall below the poverty line uh, in South Africa. 99% uh, of them are black South Africans. And so I think that we've got to look at focusing on empowerment policies that are able to uplift South Africans without resorting to the slavish rent seeking uh, policies uh, of triple B double E. But what, what you have to do is to make sure that this message that goes out is clear and un unambiguous to everyone who listens to it. That when they look at your party, they know who you are, they know what you stand for, and they know what you're trying to do for the future. And you then got to paint that future in spectacular technicolor for those voters so that they understand 
where you're going. I think the DA has been very, very good in the past at looking under the bonnet of the car and describing in great detail how the engine works when people are actually worried about the destination. What are you going to do for me? And also, that's got to be linked to stop banging on about the ANC and you've got to set out our own stall. And that's why I'm very excited that we've got someone like Gwen and Gwenny on board who's helping us develop our own stall that we can set out and invite people to join us and engage us on our own frame and our own turf. Thank you. Gwen, did you want to come in? And what I would add very briefly is that I think what we are trying to do, especially in how we've approached the policy discussions um, for this year, is to move away from having ideological debates where you get trapped between deciding, are you classically liberal, are you socially liberal, are you a democratic you know, are you, or you're a social democrat. And we think that, you know, these are some of the, the really, you know, the debates that especially I find liberals around the world can really um, weigh themselves down with when a more productive way to approach the conversation might be to talk about, well, which values and principles do we hold in common? So can we agree on accountability in government? Can we agree on the need for transparency? Can we agree on the rule of law? Can we, you know, et cetera. And so just to go through a list of our core values and principles. And I think we are really hopeful that if you approach it that way, you find a lot more people willing to sign on and say, yes, I do believe in that. But if you approach the conversation from from a perspective of let's define what is a liberal and then have an almost an ideological purity test for being part or being supportive of the DA, then you'll alienate a lot more people. So I think that's what we mean about removing the ideology out of politics. It's not to pretend that there is that these positions, because I think if you're a serious political scholar, you probably will say that, well, hang on a minute, the idea of you know the rule of law and accountability, these are grounded in certain political ideologies. But I do think that um, the way people categorize themselves, you'll find a lot more agreement even on those principles from a broader spectrum of people and to rather approach the policy conversation um, in that manner. So I think that's what we focused on and what we hope will succeed. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand over to the first three uh, questions um, that we've had people raise their hands. So firstly, I'm going to ask uh, Hannah Majetz to ask her question. Hannah, if you could just introduce yourself first and, and then put your question forward. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi guys, um, I'm calling in from the House of Commons in London. Um, I work for a member of parliament here. Um, so John, you've summarized what is happening in South Africa perfectly. And I sincerely hope that you become our official leader. Um, but why do you think people are not voting for the DA? And how do you plan to gain the vote? Do you think that factionalism and political divisions within the DA are holding the party back from reaching its true potential? Thank you for that, Hannah. Uh, that was clear and concise. I'll, I'll just take the round of three questions. So next I've got Martin Plout. Martin, if you could introduce yourself, please. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Martin, Martin Platt. I'm a member of Chatham House and uh, Institute of Commonwealth Studies. Um, the question I really have is, is about the current crisis with um, uh, the COVID-19. I mean, South Africa, you know, we're now commemorating the death of George Floyd in, in the United States, but 11 South African men have been shot by the police and by the army. It is just an extraordinary, murderous uh, way in which the government has cracked down. And uh, I wonder what your take is on that. And the other one, if I might, is to ask you about the situation in Cape Town, where I know people are working unbelievably hard, but the last thing I heard was that, that the uh, hospitals are within 30 beds of having no intensive care units left and they don't have even the staff to st staff those beds. So frankly, you are already hitting the buffers. And just how worried are you about the situation? Thank you, Martin. And, and finally, I've got Ruth Bookbinder who would like to ask a question. Ruth, if, if you could, um, if the question's to both panelists, then please say so. Uh, but if it's to one particular panelist, um, please make that clear as well. So Ruth, uh, could you just introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Ruth Bookbinder. I'm actually Alex's PhD student. Um, thank you so much for your talk. 
I guess this is um, a question for both I, both of you. I was just hoping to go into a little more detail about your plans for reforming ESCOM and about how the DA's policies diverge from the sort of 2019 roadmap. And in the short term, what sort of role do you think state-owned companies should be playing in the economy or could be playing in the economy? Thank you. Thank you. So I'll hand straight over to both of you. If you could try and keep your answers uh, as concise as possible so that we can get another round of questions in. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, look, I'll, I'll start, I'll do the first two and, and Gwen can chip in, but uh, the third one, I know she spent a lot of time on and effort on, so uh, I think that uh, she'd probably better be able to answer than I would. Um, just uh, Hannah's question, look, I mean, you know, political contestation um, is a natural phenomenon in political parties. And I think that the DA gets a really bad rap in South Africa in terms of what is essentially political contestation between different people in the party and different ideas. And this is natural. I mean, not every conservative MP agreed with Brexit. Not every Republican likes Donald Trump. Uh, but, you know, there's more that unites them that divides them. But it does spill over into these battles. But I would say this, that for all the contestation in the DA, uh, we've never thrown chairs at each other and never certainly had uh, political assassinations as you've seen in many other political organizations. So I think the media do overplay uh, the internal politics of the DA. And also they struggle to see the DA through its own lens. They can only see the DA through the lens of the ANC. And so they layer an ANC lens over the DA and then try and interpret the DA through an ANC lens. It's impossible to do so. We're a completely different political organization. We've got a completely different culture. The second question, uh, Hannah, around why people haven't voted for the DA. Well, I think there's a number of reasons. First of all, I think we lost our way. Uh, I think we uh, slipped our ideological moorings and we were stuck in a drift. And when you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. And I think that uh, typifies what happened in the last two years and, and why we were, uh, you know, had a significant setback in this last election and why we had to introspect and look very carefully about how we can fix things and make sure that we can do so. We've done so through an internal review process. But I think we've got to be authentic and genuine. I think we've got to set out our own compelling vision of hope and change for South Africans. And then I think we've got to be able to deliver that message directly to more citizens in their homes, in their language that they understand and speak, and in a way in which it relates to them. And this is where I agree completely with Gwen. I think the DA got lost in the weeds around who was a liberal, with the difference between a classic liberal and a social liberal, when it doesn't matter a jot to somebody who doesn't have a job, who has got no electricity or water or running water, and whose children are in a school with uh, 50 other kids in a class. Uh, those are not the issues that worry them. Uh, it's those bread and butter issues that worry them. They don't care about who's a liberal and who's not. And so I think the DA has got to focus less on these ideological debates and get down to the brass tacks about what are the key problems in cyber? What are the 15 things we can do in the next 10 years to get South Africa onto a high growth, um, low debt trajectory of high, high employment? And then just relentlessly communicate that in volume over time and rebuild that trust. Martin, um, yeah, I mean, the point you make about the police brutality is something that we were really concerned about right from the beginning. And in the second or third week, we had seen this terrible outbreak of authoritarianism and jackboot mentality. And we actually had a point in the lockdown where there were more deaths from police and army brutality than there were from the virus itself. And this is completely unacceptable. But this is what happens when you remove parliamentary oversight during a function like this. So we had called for an ad hoc committee to be created in parliament to oversee uh, executive action during this time. It, uh, the speaker, I think, bottled it and let the institution down. And of course, the executive were having none of it because they've been enjoying the unfettered power uh, that they've been able to uh, lord it over the rest of South Africa with this authoritarianism. And so you've missed that parliamentary oversight and pretty soon uh, the armed services re resorted to tap and started beating up innocent South Africans who were forced to go about their daily lives because they have no option. You can't self-isolate if you're in a, in a small shack with six other people or in a two-roomed RDP house uh, with a family of, of 10. It's, it's impossible to stay indoors uh, all day in, in those conditions. And yet, these are the people who bore the brunt of it. Uh, so we set up a number of uh, WhatsApp and uh, reporting lines. 
We have over 300 now live cases that we have got before IPID and through uh, to the SAPS uh, and the uh, military ombudsperson. And we're following them up and we're gonna make sure that every single one of those cases uh, is absolutely prosecuted uh, to conclusion. In terms of Cape Town, it has been tough because Cape Town, for a variety of reasons, seems to be peaking before the rest of South Africa. Uh, and it's been very, very difficult. The modeling uh, that Cape Town had used in the beginning uh, has now had to be readjusted. Uh, but we have now have a, a, over 800 bed uh, facility at the RCC and another 200 bed facility in Kailicha. Uh, Premier Wendy said last week that, that we need to get more uh, ICU beds and medical personnel. And so this week, a call's gone out for the medical personnel. But also, to, it's, uh, it has, uh, we've uh, been able to start working towards securing more ICU beds. But the truth of the matter and the tragedy is, is that what's happening in the Western Cape is probably either coming to a province near it soon, uh, if it's not happening already. Now, the Western Cape has been testing, tracing, and tracking at levels uh, far uh, greater than any of the other provinces. And that is why, you know, when you go looking for the virus, you're gonna find it. And the Western Cape's also focused on community transmissions and trying to isolate those small outbreaks of community transitions, rather than trying to battle the inferno of a massive peak. And that is also reflected in the numbers. But there's uh, the nine weeks that South Africa had, as unfortunately, as I said in, when I, in my remarks earlier, largely been squandered because the healthcare response uh, is, is nowhere near ready, I believe, uh, for, for what is to come and certainly the peak to come. Gwen, I think you can take the one on, on, on state and entities. I know it's a passion of yours. Um, I will do that. Can I just answer very briefly to the first, just to add, I'll skip the second question on COVID and I'll go then to the um, ESPN question. On the first, I, you know, why are people not voting? Do I think an, an important element to add there is also a serious conversation about available market share, depending on what your values and principles are. And I think sometimes there is an idea as well amongst even our supporters, amongst um, the electorates, and obviously amongst um, the media who, or, or analysts who write on political parties, that a country's entire electorate is available to every single voter. Now, that's obviously not true. Electoral markets, I don't think, are very different in this respect to consumer markets. If you are in the business, and I like to make the example of selling Turkish delight, um, to say that your entire market share is every single consumer would be misguided. Your market share is likely much smaller than that. It might be people who are interested in confectionaries, it might be people who like you know, I, I don't know, um, you know, but it's definitely confined in some respects. And for the DA, well, we start from our values and principles. And I think if you're approaching an electorate, that's the first thing that you have to say is how many people in this electorate actually are available to a message about a market-led economy, about, you know, certain freedoms, freedom of speech, et cetera, um, about the rule of law, about accountability, who are we talking to here? Um, and I think electoral success, first and foremost, must always be judged against that available market share. Um, so I think firstly, that's what it, how it needs to be approached as opposed to a conversation that um, thinks that the entire electorate is always available. So short term, prior to every single election, you're trying to actually maximize or turn out the vote amongst the available um, electoral pool who, who share your values and principles. But obviously a more long-term pro project is to continuously expand that, that, um, that market share, to increase the number of people, if you want, who like Turkish delight. But that's a more long-term project. And I think we must find ways of assessing how we how we're performing um, in that project. But I think that's one of the the, the constraints that I think is important um, to think about. Um, and then also on, on factionism, we are having uh, before the, the, the formal um, this formal discussion um, conversation with with Alex, and he asked something very similar. And I mentioned a point about how I think South Africa comes from a political tradition of democratic centralism, and I think it's so it's so imbibed now in our politics this idea that parties should be democratic internally, but once they've come to a decision, every single member of that party must hold the party line. And I think this is a deeply destructive way to approach um, politics. And I think it really robs 
the political landscape of rich, diverse voices, which are often within political parties themselves. And I think a much more um, mature approach is to accept that even within political parties, people will differ on certain policies, but th this is not a fundamental problem for the unity or the strength or the integrity of that party. And, you know, I myself would find it very easy if I was on a, on a platform such as this, where somebody asked for where does the DA stand on a particular issue to very easily say this is the party line and explain what that party line is and then say but this party line does have some dissent within the party of which I am a part of and this is what the dissenting view has said although it is not party policy and I think uh, an, an electorate that is mature can handle that kind of distinction to, to be clear what the party line is and also to be enriched by the conversation of those within political parties who don't carry or support the present uh, party line. And I think sometimes, you know, the idea of, of, of factions in South African political parties is seen from the point of view of colleagues who are just having a very healthy debate on, on, on policy issues and that it's not really true factionalism in a way that has or poses a danger to de destabilizing the, um, the entire political party. On ESCOM, I mean, I would also love to have an offline conversation and go through some of our uh, policy submissions that we've made on this because it is a big topic and I think also one where is a perfect example of the, um, the issue of, you know, shortcomings in implementation. I don't think there are sh there's any shortage of, even outside the DA, of people with policy responses um, to South Africa's energy crisis. But ours has always focused on, if I can put it broadly, three aspects, skills, infrastructure, and the and, and, and private and building private capacity. So for many years, ESCOM has been gouged of the kind of skills which is necessary to run a state-led um, utility of, of that nature, and also really infrastructure that has not been um, developed and has been neglected over decades. And then obviously the lack of bringing in private capacity now, which we think would relieve ESCOM of its um, generation issues, particularly on the generation side, we've always pushed very strongly for bringing in increasingly private participants um, in um, electricity generation in South Africa. Um, and we continue to push the need for greater independent uh, power producers and not just to think of it commercially in the sense of businesses who might be able to or industry that might be able to contribute there but the need to actually start giving a bit of that power back to households and to smaller businesses as well where we have proposed um, a subsidy for um, the provision of solar to, business, to small businesses and to domestic households but in a nutshell it comes down to those three areas around um, skills and making sure that the state utility um, is properly capacitated to infrastructure, which ties in with many of our other p policy positions around how policies like um, BE in South Africa have been used actually to denude state-owned entities of their necessary skills and how um, important infrastructural tenders have gone to comrades instead of people who are really fit and up to the job. Um, so these, these policies don't, don't stand in isolation and then also increasing um, private capacity in electricity generation. But I'd love to talk in more detail about some of the more technical aspects of that um, offer with regards to ESKIM. But I think there was a part of your question that related to state owned entities in general, um, not just um, ESCOM, and where we see the place of SOEs. And I'd say that we are not a hardliner kind of free market, you know, free market part decisions. There's absolutely we don't take that view that there should be, um, the state should get out of every single state owned enterprise, but certainly those where the, the state is um, is struggling to keep them viable and where there's a strong commercial case for them. So in other words, they are more than sufficient public, I'm sorry, private players that are able to, uh, to operate in that sector and where competition is not an issue, we definitely see a strong role for uh, private participants. And that certainly applies to, um, to, to at least the generation business of ESCOM and it certainly applies to the national airline as well, SAA, where we feel those are not um, assets that the state needs to hold on to just because the private sector capacity is there to make, um, to make sure that that operate successfully. Thank you, Gwen. Um, I'll, I'll just move straight on to the next three questions as quickly as I can. Um, so firstly, John Battersby, could you introduce yourself and tell us who your question is for?
Right. Um, yes, thank you, John Battersby. I'm the um, <clears throat> Chair of Trustees of the Canon Collins Educational Trust and uh, the Director of the South African Chamber of Commerce in the UK. Uh, <clears throat> my question uh, to both the panelists, I guess, but probably um, primarily to John Steenhuisen, is about corruption. Um, we had the uh, we had the uh, uh, Treasurer uh, General of the ANC at Chatham House a couple of weeks ago. I asked him the same question. Uh, given the president's um, unequivocal commitment to root out corruption um, and uh, and ensure that uh, those who were responsible for the corruption during the Zuma era were brought to book, um, I asked what progress had been made, and uh, I was told that. So uh, the Revenue Services and um, Transnet have got new new CEOs. Um, but as far as I know, as far as I can establish, not a single of the main culprits have been brought to book um, and very little funds have been um, uh, repatriated to South Africa. So in the light of that and in the light of the fact that the civil service, the civil society organization, OTA, recently um, had a major success in getting uh, the former chair of South African Airways, um, who was by all accounts responsible for driving it into the ground, um, declared a delinquent CEO for the rest of her career. Um, what is the what has the DA done to deal with corruption? Because all the all the fine plans and all the um, positive things that um, John Steen has outlined come to naught um, if you continue with a, um, he, he spoke about an incapable state, but also a deeply corrupt state, which clearly uh, went very deep. What is the DA doing about that? Thank you, John. Um, and moving quickly on to uh, Sibongile Zulu, uh, I believe you have a question. And if you could try to keep it as concise as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sibongile Zulu. I'm an MPhil student at the University of Cambridge. Uh, well, my question is two-pronged. I'd really like to unpack this question of the role of opposition parties within pandemics. So what I would like to know from both of you is what exactly or how exactly do you envision the role of the DA in public health emergencies, either COVID as we're doing now and future ones that, may, that might occur in a few years, and also, how will this inform the DA's policy regarding pandemic preparedness and responses in the future? Wonderful. Thank you, Sibongile. Um, and now, finally, over to Lutero Simango. Uh, Lutero, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm Lutero Simango, uh, Chief Whip of MDM in the Mozambican Parliament. So let me first of all uh, congratulate uh, John and also Ngwenya for talking about what is happening today in South Africa. And uh, I must agree saying that um, when you say that uh, COVID-19 has exposed the social economical situation of South Africa, that's true, I do believe. Also, the same thing is happening in, uh, in Mozambique. So I would like to ask very quickly, in what would be the measures that should be taken now in for short term in order to give some strength to the small and medium enterprises so that they can keep on maintaining on the post of jobs and also to generate opportunities to others. And last question, do you have any political links with other political parties within South Africa in order to create a, a sort of a national coalition so that you can overcome the ruling party in South Africa? Thank, so you. My Thank you very much. John, sorry, I just wanted to, to bring the speakers back in so that you have a bit of time to answer. If you could keep your answers once again a little bit concise, that would be great. Thank you. 
you asking a politician to be concise is like <laughs> asking a duck not to swim. And so, but thanks very much. I'll do my best. Um, John, uh, yeah, look, I mean, corruption is a huge problem in South Africa, and it lies at the heart of many of the failures in our state. Um, and when we talk about how the state's been hollowed out, it's by corruption. Um, one of the uh, ministers put it at 100 billion lost. Uh, I think that's a very conservative figure. Think about the opportunity cost of that money in terms of building schools, roads, on a social spend. So it is a huge, huge problem. But the problem is, is not so much corruption in South Africa. It is the accountability gap that exists in South Africa. So we have some of the most advanced legislation in the world that deals with municipal finance management, with the Public Audit Act, the Public Finance Management Act. And all of these have very serious consequences for those guilty of financial misconduct, including jail time. Uh, and yet this legislation, while well intended, is never actually uh, used to its full extent. And that you'll see uh, public officials that commit corruption or simply move from one department to the next. So what have we done? Well, what we've done is to lay criminal charges in all cases where we have uh, been able to. Uh, we laid uh, charges against um, uh, a host of people from um, Shlady Motswaneng, uh, to Sean Abrams and others. We've gone to court in many instances uh, on the corruption. You may recall that we've been in court trying to get Mr. Zuma his court date that he keeps wanting but does his best to avoid for the last decade. Uh, and we have started to succeed uh, in that. Uh, we've been able to, through courts, be able to have uh, dodgy uh, public protectors, uh, public uh, prosecutors removed. So Menzi Simolani has been removed. We've got Shladi Motsaneng removed at the SABC, and we continue to pursue legally uh, a number of those, those individuals. But the truth of the matter is that until government develops the spine to be able to go hard after those individuals, you're never going to be able to stop the scourge. Now, you, know, you, con you contrast the case of Mr. Zuma uh, with the case of uh, Mrs. Park Gunhai in South Korea, who uh, from the time of being uh, fingered for, uh, for corruption and maladministration, to being jailed for a 24 year term was I think about a year. Uh, we've had Mr. Zuma who's been out uh, on a long, long leash for way, way too long. And the problem is, I don't know if, if our president's got the bottle to be able to take the fight to the corrupt because the problem with a compromised organization is that everybody knows everybody else's secrets. They, uh, Batabile Dlamini, our former minister put it uh, well when she said, everybody knows everyone else's small Inyana skeletons. And so the problem is that if so, if you move against Didi Mabuza, you're going to have uh, him moving against you and your associates because everybody knows everybody's uh, dirty network and, and that, that has happened. So we need to get a prosecuting authority that is capable to, to prosecute as well. And I think that was very obvious during the Steinhoff matter and certainly when they appeared before Parliament. Uh, many of our prosecuting uh, authorities do not have the capacity to be able to prosecute corruption efficiently because they've also been hollowed out over the years with experience. And that's going to take a bit of time, I imagine. But certainly the low hanging fruit should be gone after. And the state capture process has, uh, has exposed a number of very key and senior people, many of whom are now sitting as chairs of parliamentary portfolio committees. And yet the only people that have been arrested and charged have been the whistleblowers in many of these cases, Angelo Agritzi and others. And there have been no consequences whatsoever there. So we continue to, to push very hard and to keep the public spotlight on this and to use our limited resources where we can to get into the courts and to uh, bring justice to the courts when the government refuses uh, to act. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, that, is, that is what we continue to do. Uh, Sibongile, thank you very much for, for the question. Yeah, it's tough for an opposition party in a pandemic because you, what you don't want to do is to be seen to be uh, pulling against the national effort. And so in the beginning of the crisis, we told government we will support them uh, in the uh, three week of lockdown, uh, but that we wanted to play a role going forward. And, you know, a lot of people in the country have expected the DA to simply sit in a corner and be quiet and let government get on with it. And we made a determined decision right from the beginning. We weren't going to do that and that we were going to contribute to uh, defeating the coronavirus. And so we were able to produce within a week of the lockdown starting a blue book, which looked at a ministry by ministry 
approach to what needed to be done to prepare the country for that. We made extensive uh, recommendations on uh, on the regulations. Uh, we spoke out against some of the bizarre regulations. And we also put on the table a smart lockdown model, which would have allowed government to exit the damaging hard lockdown so much earlier had it just got the fundamentals of managing the pandemic right. But unfortunately, when the president chose after that third week to extend the hard lockdown for uh, a further four weeks, it, it really, we started to diverge there because we could see the twin threat to the economy and to people's lives from a spread of the virus on the one hand, but also a grinding economic depression on the other. And we also realized just how fragile so many households are. We now have a situation as we sit here this evening, where more than 50% of South African households are now food insecure, and that is significant. So our job is to be constructive, and we were constructive, but our job is also to critique the government where they go wrong, and we've done that by calling them out on the lack of accountability and transparency and unconstitutional behavior and calling them out on the irrationality and unreasonableness of the many of the, of the regulations. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the uh, chief whip there, uh, it's nice to, to meet you and to be with you. Um, look, I mean, the, the key lies in getting as much money as quickly as possible into the hands of those small businesses to provide essentially a bridge so if you see COVID as the river, you've got to get them to the other side uh, of that bridge. And then you can worry about what's done uh, once you've got them to the other side safely. And you do that by getting money into the hands. Ed. So you have stimulus packages, you have the TERS system, you have UIF. And all of these were noble projects. But as I said when I, in my address, they hit the brick wall of an incapable state that wasn't able to get the money uh, into the hands of businesses wasn't able to get UIF payments into the hands of the people who needed them. And the result is that we've had widespread business failure. We've got widespread retrenchments and job losses. And we've got people who've now lost, uh, lost their livelihoods and businesses that they've built up, all because the government couldn't act quickly enough because the incapable state had rendered the machinery that should be able to deliver that age effectively and efficiently was completely gone. And so even paying an increase on a social grant uh, was a complete de debacle uh, because uh, the, the systems have been so hollowed out. Uh, yes, we do have relationships with other parties. We're in coalitions with other parties around the country uh, in some municipalities. And obviously, we believe that the future lies in a realignment of South African politics around a shared set of values and principles, uh, and that the hinterland of South Africa lies uh, in, uh, in bringing black-minded individuals together breaking down ideologies and focusing what are the 10, 15 things we need to do for the next decade to get the country moving forward and to unite people around that. Gwed, I don't know if you want to add to that. Very briefly, because I'm, I'm aware of the time challenges, but on the first, um, I think how important it is to, to, to not just focus um, so extensively on corruption. In fact, there was an argument internally, at least, since I think in South African politics, that the DA had almost veered too far on the side of being anti-corruption and fighting against corruption, that many people began to ask themselves. So assuming that the DA is the party of clean governance and assuming that the current governing party starts to govern better and roots out corruption, does the DA have a unique offer outside of clean governance? And I think it's, so I, I think that's very important that we also point out that many of South Africa's shortcomings and our current economic woes are not just a product of, of corruption and bad governance, but that many of the policies that we put in place, and certainly I won't go into them because John covered them in the formal part of his presentation, that we actually have a policy problem and also not just a policy implementation problem, the, the, the policy or the, or the economic theory or evidence that underpins some of our policy approaches um, is lacking. And we, I think we are trying to speak more and focus more on those policy solutions, as opposed to just being the opposition of anti-corruption. Although there is always a danger of veering too much on the one side. So the danger is that we could now become far too just solutions driven and putting forward solutions that we lose or drop the ball on fighting corruption as effectively. So I think it will always be um, a, um, a juggle, a juggle between the two. But I think it's important that we aren't just seen as a party that's um, that's anti-corruption. Um, I won't go into the third question, but the second around um, the role of the opposition in a health response. I think 
John's, John's covered the, the bulk of it, but something that I thought was important from our own experience to add was how important it was for the opposition to play the role of amplifying dissenting expert opinion or even expert opinion um, at that. Um, we saw in the very beginning, there was an attempt to close and to keep um, the experts talking only to government and for government to be the central communication line on what was happening um, with COVID. And even as the official opposition, we initially struggled to get some of the country's top ep epidemiologists to talk to us. But once they did, it started becoming quite clear that there, were, that there was not as much consensus even within um, the, those experts advising government on what the approach should be and some very valid concerns. And so I think that if anything, we've also so played a, a, a pivotal role and, and early on, I think, amplifying those expert voices who were saying, for example, that the lockdown has served its useful purpose. And, you know, for the last few weeks, we've really been um, flogging now um, a dead horse. And some of the earlier evidence suggesting that we weren't losing the lockdown for its intended purpose, for ramping up testing, for increasing healthcare capacity, information that the public, I think, would have otherwise been blind to if we're not actively trying to seek out um, experts um, and, and, and to amplify their voices. So I think that's an important role in addition to what John has said, that opposition parties have to play, even when it may be unpopular in the beginning to go against kind of the national mood or the initial government line. Thank you both for those answers. And, and apologies to those of you who've lined up to ask further questions. We are out of time. And I'm very grateful to the two speakers for allowing us to go uh, slightly over on time today. So. Once again, thank you very much, John and Gwen, for your interventions today. And without further ado, I'll just hand over to Chris quickly in London, who wants to have a final word. Yep, thank you very much, Alex. And uh, on behalf of Chatham House, I'd just like to say thank you very much to John Steenhuisen and Gwen and Gwenya for your interventions this afternoon. Fascinating discussion. And a big thank you to Alex Beresford as well for chairing the discussion uh, and bringing along some participants as well, making your students log in too. Um, Chatham House will continue its webinars, uh, the Chatham House Africa programme will continue its webinars on Africa. And we've got a webinar on Monday the 8th of June on deep technology in Africa and we'll also be continuing our country specific webinars with um, webinars on Mozambique on the 16th of June and on Sudan on the 17th of June so we very much hope that we can see you all again at one of those. Thank you very much.